Did you know that there's a type of headache condition that predominantly affects young women and left untreated can lead to blindness? It's a condition where you have symptoms of a brain tumor, but you actually don't. September is Idiopathic Intracranial Hypertension Awareness Month or Pseudotumor Cerebri. So let's talk about it. Yesterday, I presented the case of a 29-year-old woman who came to my office with complaints of headaches for years with increasing problems in her peripheral vision that led her to go see her ophthalmologist. He did a fundoscopic examination of her retina where you dilate the eyes and look at the back of the eye. That actually lets them look at part of the brain called the optic nerve. Typically, when we look at the retina, we can visualize the optic disc, which is where the nerve inserts on the back of our eye that allows us to see. And if there is any problems with increased pressure in our brain, it can look swollen, like in this picture. And this is called papilla edema. That is one of the reasons why your eye doctor will actually look in the back of your eyes. Optic nerve arises from the brain and it connects to the back of our eyes. And if there's increased pressure inside of your brain, it can cause there to be swelling within the nerve itself and cause this optic disc to look like it's bulging. This patient has a diagnosis of what's called idiopathic intracranial hypertension or also called pseudotumor cerebri. It can occur in any gender and any age, but predominantly affects women of childbearing age, particularly when it's coupled with obesity. 90% of the time it affects women. So why do they call it pseudotumor? It's because the presenting symptoms are very much like a brain tumor where the pressure in the brain is elevated. However, their scans show no signs of tumor. So we call it a pseudo tumor, meaning it's a false brain tumor. Symptoms most often are characterized by headache and blurred vision. Other symptoms can be ringing in the ears from the increased pressure, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, forgetfulness, and or depression. Since exertion and valsalva maneuvers can increase the intracranial pressure, any type of exercise can make the headaches worse or other things like sneezing or bearing down to have a bowel movement. It's commonly misdiagnosed as migraine headaches. Now keep in mind, migraines with visual disturbance are markedly different than pseudotumor patients where the vision problems are persistent. It typically starts with a decrease or blurriness in the peripheral vision or this part of your vision right here. Pulsatile tinnitus or ringing in the ears can also be a symptom of pseudotumor where it almost feels like you can hear your heartbeat in your ear. The hallmark of the diagnosis of pseudotumor is that papal edema where on ocular examination of the eye, you can see that the optic disc is bulging or swollen and it's in both eyes almost all the time. Unilateral problems with papal edema can happen, but it's not as common. An MRI and MRV of the brain is extremely important in making the diagnosis mostly to exclude something that could be causing increased intracranial pressure. One of the findings that we see commonly on patients with pseudotumor is what's called an empty cella. You can also see that right here. Patients with chronically elevated intracranial pressure can cause the diaphragm at the, where the pituitary inserts on the brain to become weak and then actually can push CSF or spinal fluid into the area where the pituitary gland should usually lie. 60% of the time we'll also see posterior globe flattening where the back of the eye can start to look flat. The small little gray thing right here is the optic nerve and you can also see where the nerve will look tortuous or have curves to it that's not normal. We wanna make sure that any patient with a diagnosis of pseudotumor has an MRV or a venogram checking all the venous structures in their brain. That's because sometimes there can be a venous thrombosis or an obstruction in the vasculature of the brain that causes a decrease in the outflow of the brain and can cause a rise in the pressure. What? Okay, think of the blood that goes into the brain like a highway. You have arteries that bring blood into the brain and veins that drain the blood out of the brain. So if there is an obstruction in that outflow, like a clot that's sitting in one of the brains, the blood can rush in, but it can't rush out. Therefore, causing the pressure inside of the brain to build. You always want to rule out a venous thrombosis as a potential treatable cause of pseudotumor. Okay, so what else can cause it besides a clot? Like a lot of things in medicine, we're not really sure what can potentially cause it. 
for some reason the body can overproduce spinal fluid or have a decreased rate of resorption leading to too much spinal fluid inside of the brain therefore the treatment is decreasing the amount of fluid inside of the head now there's a couple of ways that we can do that and it doesn't always involve surgery we will often perform a lumbar puncture also known as a spinal tap to make the diagnosis because it allows us to measure the pressure in the head from measuring it in the back because all of this fluid communicates. When we do that spinal tap, we can drain pressure off of the back and that will help alleviate pressure in the brain and it can treat the symptoms, but that's temporary. I mentioned earlier in the video, this predominantly affects women who are overweight. So of course, weight loss can be curative. Studies have shown that reducing your body weight by five to 10% can cause the tumor to go into remission. Do you wanna know something really interesting? I did a video on this several months ago, but there have been some studies that show the use of GLP-1 medications can actually also help pseudotumor and it's not by weight loss. It's thought that these medications can actually reduce the production of CSF and therefore can help alleviate the symptoms. It's a very interesting use of these medications and I think we still have a lot to learn from this. There are other medications that we use to help reduce the production of CSF and one of those medications is called acetazolamide and it can reduce the production of spinal fluid by up to 50%. It's a diuretic medication and we often will start treatment of this diagnosis with this medication before anything interventional. Acetazolamide is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and other medications in this family can also help the symptoms, including topiramate, also known as Topamax, and other diuretics such as Lasix, also known as furosemide. Now, in those cases that fail medical treatment, surgery may be the next step. In patients with severe vision problems, we can do a surgery called an optic nerve fenestration where we can make small slits in the optic nerve to alleviate the pressure in the nerve and save the vision. And where I come in as a neurosurgeon is to perform a cerebrospinal fluid shunting procedure called a ventriculoperitoneal shunt or a lumboperitoneal shunt where we can place a tubing either inside of the brain or inside of our back within the spinal fluid space to divert the spinal fluid to the abdomen. This is a tube that'll take the fluid off of the brain and put it in another space in our abdomen where our body can naturally resorb that fluid. A little diversion tactic. What's the prognosis? It really depends on how severe the vision loss is, how bad the papilla edema is, and how quickly these symptoms came on. There is the chance that there can be permanent nerve damage if this is left untreated for too long. Any patients with ongoing visual problems need prompt medical treatment and occasionally prompt surgical treatment. That's why it's extremely important to rule out this condition on any patients with migraines and vision problems. Back to our patient. She underwent a lumbar puncture and her intracranial pressure was 45. Just to give you an idea, a normal intracranial pressure is around 15. She was started on acetazolamide, but she could not tolerate this medication due to its severe side effects on her. She came to see me for evaluation of a shunt and we discussed the risks, benefits, and alternatives of a brain shunt versus a lumbar shunt and we elected to do what's called a ventricular peritoneal shunt. In my practice, I typically will recommend a ventricular peritoneal shunt where we divert fluid from the brain into the abdomen. She underwent that procedure, which took approximately 45 minutes. She went home the next day and had complete resolution of all of her symptoms. Remember that September is IIH Awareness Month. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.